This anime begins with an attack on some facilities, where a boy approached the camera to ask about a girl named Asaka. Meanwhile, in those same facilities, a girl threatened another with a weapon. The woman complained because she was promised that no one would harm anyone. The girl with the weapon asked the other to keep quiet. The boy entered the room and was happy to find Asaka. The latter was surprised to see the boy, named Yogi. Asaka asked him what he was doing in the facilities, and the woman took the opportunity to threaten Yagiri, asking him not to attempt anything or else she would shoot Asaka. Yagiri looked closely at the woman and used his power on her. Asaka was surprised to see the woman fall to the ground and wondered what was happening. Yagiri ran towards Asaka and hugged her tightly, asking her to come back home. Then, we switch scenes to a boy waking up on a bus because of a student. It was Yagiri, and he mistook Asaka for another girl. He asked her who she was, and the girl introduced herself as Tomachika Danara. Yagiri questioned her to know if the bus could reach its destination. But Tomachika showed him that the vehicle was attacked. She complained to him, reproaching him for how he could fall asleep with so much commotion. Yagiri looked at the bodies and didn't understand what was happening. Suddenly, something shook the bus. He threw a microphone at the thing causing the shaking, and it turned out to be a wyvern. It got annoyed by the blow it received with the microphone and took flight to ram the vehicle. Yagiri quickly used his power to defeat the wyvern by mentioning a single word. Then he took a seat, took out his console to play, and asked Danara to sit next to him and explain what happened while he was asleep. Danara asked Yagiri if he didn't want to get out. Yagiri asked her what he would achieve if he did since if they left the vehicle, there would be no guarantee of safety. Danara praised him for maintaining a calm and serene attitude despite the situation but asked him to take the matter seriously and stop playing. Yagiri turned off the console and asked Danara again about what happened. She explained that the bus was about to reach the excursion destination until they entered a tunnel. Upon crossing to the other side, they came across a sunny meadow. A girl who proclaimed herself wise, named Shin, boarded the bus and asked everyone not to make a fuss and focus on her. The bus driver tried to do something, but he was killed by Shin. She clarified that she had no intention of directly harming everyone. But if someone angered her, she couldn't guarantee they would survive. She then revealed to everyone that her attack power was 530,000. Seeing that no one commented on her joke, she killed the director. She then explained that everyone arrived in another world because they were summoned by her to find future sages. She clarified that this new world is ruled by sages, but sometimes it's necessary to replenish the numbers. Shin used her power on all students except Danara and Yagiri, explaining that she installed a system called Battle Song, allowing everyone to see information and statistics as if it were a video game. Shin explained that this system is called a gift and asked them to use the power to become a sage in a month. After this, Shin left, and the first mission began. All those with the battle song system read the mission description, which stated that a wyvern was going to attack them. All the students joined forces and formed groups. Those with the system left and asked those without it to stay on the bus. Those without the system disagreed with staying, so they would be betrayed by their own classmates who had a system, arguing that if they followed them, they would only be a burden to others. Danara commented to the leader of this strategy that her companion wouldn't betray her, but the leader showed her that her companion was the first to leave. Yagiri, upon hearing this story, worried more about the battery of his console since he couldn't think of a way to charge the console and play in another world. Yagiri got up from his seat and commented that if that student who assumed leadership was right, there should only be one dragon for the mission. Danara asked Yagiri if he did something, and he replied that he didn't because he couldn't believe that everyone died because the driver crashed at the end of the tunnel. Danara didn't understand what he meant, and Yogiri changed the subject. He got off the bus with Danara, and both explored the world, which was divided into three stations, hill, city, and forest. Danara would notice something approaching in the sky. Yogiri asked if it was another dragon, but she replied that no, it was Higashida, Fukuhara, and Hanakawa, who were flying towards them. Yagiri asked if he should kill them, but Danara asked him not to, as they are their classmates after all. Yagiri reminded her that they were the ones who abandoned her on the bus, which is something any killer would do. Danara commented that it didn't justify taking a life, and Yagiri mentioned that there was still the possibility that they were approaching with hostile intentions. The three students landed in front of Danara and Yagiri, impressed that they were still alive and that the dragon was dead. Hanakawa was disappointed by this, as his intention was for Danara to die so he could turn her body into a zombie. Higashida scolded him, saying he should have anticipated the possibility that Danara was still alive. Fukuhara commented that the idea of letting her die and turning her into a zombie to control her was too disturbing. 
Higashida didn't take this seriously, as he just wanted to see the look of terror on Danara's face. She approached Yagiri to whisper in his ear that they didn't seem to have returned very friendly. Higashida got upset by this and didn't hesitate to throw a fireball as a threat. The fireball passed close to Danara, who froze in fear, and it hit a mountain, causing a powerful explosion. Higashida commented that he couldn't use anything more than basic magic, but that wasn't an impediment to refining magic. Then he threatened Danara to ask her to leave with them. She asked why she should follow them. Higashida commented that he decided to do whatever he wanted from now on, which meant he would use her as he pleased. Hanakawa confessed in a macabre manner that Danara is the type of girl he dreams of every night. Disgusted, Danara commented that she wouldn't let them flirt with her. This impressed Yagiri, as he didn't expect her to have the courage to speak up in such a delicate situation. Higashida became jealous when he saw Yagiri talking to Danara and asked if they had known each other for a long time. Yagiri ignored him and told Danara that he would handle talking to them. But if things started to get complicated, he wouldn't hesitate to act. To prove his point, he pointed his finger at Higashida and asked him to die. Hanakawa and Fukuhara laughed at Yagiri, as they didn't believe those words would have any effect. However, they were completely frozen with fear when they saw Higashida fall to the ground a few seconds later. Hanakawa asked if he was okay, and Yagiri explained that Higashida died because he ordered it himself and asked if it was too difficult to realize that he also had powers. Yagiri warned them not to try anything. Seeing Fukuhara trying to do something, he quickly killed him with his power, which scared Hanakawa, who then followed Yagiri's orders. Yagiri asked Hanakawa to check for himself if his companions were dead. Hanakawa decided to use his healing power on his companions to see if they could react. He explained that his power allowed him to regenerate any kind of wound. However, he was surprised to see that his power didn't work because they were dead. Danara asked if the dragon's death had to do with his power. Yagiri replied that it's complicated to explain, but he confirmed it, saying that he must be careful when explaining his ability, as Hanakawa seems like the type of stupid person who could misunderstand everything. Furthermore, if he revealed all the information, it could create another conflict in which he wasn't interested. Hanakawa called the protagonist a monster, but he defended himself, saying that he only did it in self-defense. After all, they were the ones who attacked first and then he explained his ability. He explained that his ability is called instant death to any target. If he thinks about wanting to kill someone, that person will die immediately. Hanakawa, upon hearing this, quickly approached Yagiri to kill him, but he stopped him, saying that his ability also takes effect on any living being that intends to kill him, clarifying that anyone with thoughts or who decides to kill him will die. Hanakawa asked how someone can beat him, as with such an ability, he is practically invincible. After these words, he fell to the ground on his knees, crying. Yagiri asked why everyone believed so much in themselves after receiving their powers. Hanakawa revealed that this is not the first time everyone has visited this world. He said that it all happened recently. The mage of the Magnet Kingdom summoned heroes from all worlds to defeat the Demon King. Yagiri asked if everyone ventured into the world for a year, and at the moment they defeated the Demon King, they were returned to their original worlds. Hanakawa replied yes and asked not to summarize his heroic story so lightly. Yagiri looked at Danara and asked if they were students who missed class at least once. She said no. Hanakawa explained that everyone returned home and realized that the time between the world and the real world was different, as only a few hours had passed. With this explanation, Yagiri deduced that there must be a way to return to the real world. He then pointed his hand at Hanakawa to kill him. Hanakawa, scared, begged for his life and asked Danara for her opinion, asking her to smooth things over between him and the protagonist. Yagiri defended himself, saying he was only doing it to eliminate future problems now that he revealed his ability. Danara commented that she was alive because Yogiri saved her from the dragon, so she had no right to comment or do anything about the matter. Hanakawa was frightened to hear this and labeled Danara as too cold. He quickly pulled out a golden collar and explained that it was a magical object that turned a person into a slave. Hanakawa offered to become a slave to both of them if they spared his life. Before they could say anything, Hanakawa put on the collar, activating its effects. He slowly approached Danara, who ordered him to stay away. The collar took effect and forced Hanakawa to step back. Danara commented that it was too disturbing to treat someone as a slave and asked if there was any way to ignore the effects of the collar. Hanakawa replied that there wasn't, but he had the option to transfer the slave to another person. Danara decided to transfer Hanakawa, making him now Yogiri's slave. The latter scratched his head, not understanding the situation very well, and decided to spare Hanakawa's life. 
The latter thanked him for giving him the opportunity to keep living. Yagiri pointed to the forest and ordered him to go to that place full of monsters. Hanakawa refused, but the collar took effect, and against his will, he went to the forest. Yagiri told him that if he survived the forest, he must keep secret that they are both alive, especially the capacity of his ability. Hanakawa did nothing but accept this condition, but then he was stopped by the protagonist's orders, who asked him to leave all his belongings before going to the forest. Hanakawa was forced to leave behind all his wealth that he had been saving throughout his hero journey, and went to the forest. Danara asked Yogiri if he was sure about that decision. The protagonist said yes, after all, they didn't know when Hanakawa might betray them. Danara asked what would happen if she rebelled, as that possibility still existed. The protagonist said that if that were to happen, he wouldn't care, as he was the one who decided to save her life. Since then, Danara didn't say anything and asked when he became someone who talks so much. Furthermore, she wanted to know why he's trying to protect her. Yogiri said he's not sure about that. Danara didn't believe him and kept insisting. Yogiri commented that it all started the moment he hugged her when the dragon attacked the bus. Meanwhile, Shin met with Yuichi, who informed her that a user with the instant death technique appeared in the world, and they must start acting more cautiously. Several days later, Danara and Yogiri arrived at the first city just as the sun was setting. Danara was relieved, but the protagonist yawned, completely exhausted from the journey. Danara noticed that the city gates were already closing. Yogiri asked if it was normal for people to close the city gates at night. Danara took Yogiri by the arm and urged him to hurry before they were locked out. They approached the guards, who escorted them to a secluded spot for questioning. The guard in charge, Masahiko, met with them, asking if they were a separate group from the students who arrived at noon. He wondered how such a situation could be happening. Danara expressed her relief that someone finally understood the situation. Yogiri, to conceal their actions, explained that they had separated from the group and tried to catch up. Masahiko was annoyed to hear this and mentioned that normally they would charge them a toll but he had orders not to intervene on the candidate's path or decisions. Yogiri asked Masahiko if he knew anything about what would happen in the capital, as he had heard that the candidates would go there and he wanted to participate. Masahiko reminded him that he had orders not to intervene in their path or decisions, so he couldn't help them. However, he could allow Danara to stay in his mansion for one night. She was embarrassed to hear this and immediately refused, quickly leaving with the protagonist. Yogiri asked why she did that, and Danara confessed that she was afraid she might kill Masahiko for his intentions. The protagonist felt offended by this and asked if she saw him as a serial killer. Danara mentioned that she was impressed that he still hadn't realized what he had done by killing his own classmates. Both continued exploring the city, and Danara was amazed that everything seemed like a fantasy story, as there were even people who looked like beasts. A girl named Mairyu approached them and asked if they were candidates for sages. Yagiri was suspicious and asked what she needed. Mairyu explained that she saw them looking lost and wanted to help them for free. Danara also suspected something. Mairyu clarified that she only wanted to have good relations with future sages and try to seduce the bachelors, as that would ensure her success. Yagiri asked Danara for her opinion and she said she wanted to take a look around the city before dark. The protagonist had no choice but to accept Mairyu's service. That night, the group would buy clothes suitable for the place, unaware that some bandits were ambushing them in an alley. Yagiri asked the group's leader if they were looking for money. He replied that no, as he was hired to eliminate the sages who had no talent and could differentiate them because most of those who arrived in the city tended to go mad. He clarified that he couldn't do anything to the sages who had potential and talent, but those who didn't, he could kill and get a good reward. In exchange, Mairyu was watching the whole situation and ordered them to be killed. After all, they were two sages who didn't possess the gift, so she saw them as inferior beings. Hyogiri remained calm under the situation and with his power, he dealt with the group that ambushed them from behind. Then he eliminated the strongest one by mentioning that only half of him should die. But he realized that even so, it was too much damage for the poor man. He tried to use several spells to injure them, however, no matter how hard he tried, it caused instant death. This scared Danara, who couldn't believe what the protagonist was doing, but he defended himself by saying that he was trying to find a way to contain his power. He tried to blind one of them, but ended up exploding his eyes, then he tried to make one faint and still caused his death. Yagiri felt guilty, knowing that injuring someone's body parts with his power wasn't beneficial, as they would die anyway. Besides, he didn't like others to think that they were torturing them on purpose. Yagiri tried to use his power on the last two remaining, but he realized that it didn't work, 
These two survivors, terrified by what they saw, fled, however, within seconds, they died. Two guards, named Jorge and Edelbart, appeared with a group of soldiers to interrogate them about the situation. Yagiri explained that they got lost and found the alley full of corpses. Edelgard knew it was a lie and confessed that he had watched everything when the bandits were about to attack them. Yagiri asked if their intention was to try to trace who had hired the bandits to target the sage candidates. Edelgard confirmed this and warned the protagonist not to attempt anything, as the guards were protected against the sages. Jorge analyzed the protagonist and Danara. Edelgard revealed that all the guards in the world have a cloak that protects them from the power of the gifts. Jorge commented to Edelgard that according to his analysis, Yogiri and Danara do not possess any gifts, so it is impossible to imprison them despite what they saw. He approached our protagonists and apologized for Edelgard's behavior. Yogiri asked him not to worry about it and asked for a place to spend the night. One of the knights checked the bandits and discovered that one had managed to escape alive. Jorge took the protagonists to a hotel. They both paid for separate rooms. Danara took advantage of the luxurious bed to lie down and saw a ghost, mistaking it for her sister. She asked if it was her, but the specter denied it and introduced herself as Makamoko Danara, the daughter of the building's owner. She explained that she decided to appear because she knows the situation has become an emergency and appeared to help them. Danara, annoyed, reproached her for not helping earlier when the bandits attacked. Makamoko clarified that she couldn't just appear out of nowhere. After all, the protagonist's ability could kill her. She then confessed that she was the one who prevented the installation of the gifts on them. Danara, upon hearing this, became even more upset and asked why she did it. Makamoko asked her if she wanted to receive power from someone so suspicious. Here they explain that while the gifts have their advantages, when you accept the power, the sage who granted it to you, that is, Shun, turns you into her puppet. Danara asked if the others who didn't receive the installation were equally protected by a spirit. Makamoko wasn't sure about this and commented that she was only doing this because she wants to return her to the real world. Danara commented that she also wants to return, but has no choice but to trust Yogiri. The next morning, Yogiri was at the reception and met Danara, asking her if she couldn't sleep well, as she looked awful. She replied that yes, after everything that happened, then she asked if they would catch up with the rest. The hotel receptionist, named Celestina, introduced herself, and the protagonist explained that she had been looking for the location of the other sages and how to reach them. It was a special service where she would investigate and facilitate language translation, money, and even resources for traveling. Celestina handed both of them tickets to travel to the capital, where they were supposed to be. Yagiri decided to travel on a train to the capital while playing on his console. Danara asked Makamoko if the protagonist could see her, she denied it, as she hadn't made herself visible. The protagonist affirmed that he could see her from the moment they started talking. Danara asked the protagonist what he planned to do in the capital. Yagiri commented that Celestina discovered that the sage candidates are in the primeval forest for training. Danara asked if Celestina is truly just a receptionist, as she knew too much. Yagiri felt a threat approaching and quickly threw himself to the ground with Danara, the roof of the train cleanly sliced off. Meanwhile, we see Edelgard and Jorge trying to interrogate the surviving bandit, but he was traumatized due to the protagonist's power. They tried to use healing magic, but nothing worked. A woman named Lane decided to pluck out one of the bandit's eyes and tried to heal his brain but she couldn't pull him out of his trauma. She decided to turn him into a vampire, but it also didn't work. Lane was somewhat amazed that nothing was working to snap the bandit out of his trance. Suddenly, a tremor shook the building and caused a collapse. Edelgard quickly threw himself with Jorge, narrowly avoiding a part of the ceiling falling on them. Jorge asked what was happening and noticed the silhouette of a man, quickly analyzing him and discovering that he possessed the rank of hero. Back with Yogiri, he heard on the train radio that the sages who were nearby in the area are fighting an assailant. This relieved the protagonist a bit because there was no one pursuing them. The protagonist decided to go out, finding a giant robot in the distance. He deduced that the robot could be the aggressor they mentioned. He analyzed the robot and believed it could be some kind of invader. Yogiri tried to find the sage but couldn't see him. Danra pointed out to our protagonist where the sage was, and Yogiri asked how he could see from so far away. A blonde boy unleashed a powerful energy blast against the robot, even managing to destroy a mountain. However, the invader was able to summon a shield that could repel these rays. The boy had no choice but to insist with more rays. The robot quickly moved, dodging each attack, and in an instant, appeared behind the blonde boy, pulled out a firearm, and began shooting at him. Yagiri, seeing the speed and the way they were fighting, felt they were in trouble. 
Danara asked the protagonist why he wasn't trying to stop the fight. Yogiri asked why he would, and Danara commented that they were delaying the trip. The protagonist asked if, by trying to stop the fight, he might accidentally kill them. Danara reminded him that they were about to die anyway if they hadn't dodged that attack on the train. The protagonist explained that while he could do it and kill them, he had his own personal rules. A large white mass approached the train at high speed and stopped right in front of Yogiri, it was the robot. The blonde boy chased after it, and here we discovered his name, Santaru. He asked the robot to stop running away. Yogiri sensed that something was about to happen, so he quickly jumped and took Danara with him. They managed to avoid Santaru's attack who threw a stab with his ice sword and froze all the passengers. Meanwhile, Lane was facing the hero, the latter threw a flurry of punches against her. Lane let herself be hit by them on purpose and managed to come out unscathed. Edelgard was amazed at the endurance the vampire had, but Jorge commented that it didn't make sense to start a fight with Lane if she had instant regeneration. The hero threw his sword at Lane, but missed. The woman asked him why he was trying to attack a sage. After all, a hero's duty is to defeat the demon king. The hero introduced himself as Iron and commented that he wouldn't listen to her, as he couldn't forgive her tyranny. He quickly threw energy at the sword and proclaimed that he would eradicate all the sages in the world. Ayn caused a powerful explosion that completely wiped out the building. Back with Yogiri, he asked Santaru why he was attacking them since they had nothing to do with the fight. Santaru reminded him that his duty was to kneel on the ground and praise a sage when one was present. Seeing that Santaru had no intentions of negotiating, Yogiri decided to kill him. The robot, seeing this, approached the protagonist, raised its hand in a peace sign, and mentioned that it had no intention of fighting them. At the same time, Ayn was glad that he had ended everything in Ariel's name. Lane asked him if Ariel was his lover. Ayn, seeing her, was horrified and asked her how she could have avoided that explosion, as he had made sure that no one would survive with that technique. Lane replied that she hadn't moved from her spot. After all, she was a vampire with instant regeneration, so she couldn't die anyway. Ayn said that was impossible due to the functioning of his technique, but Lane clarified that she had tried to die several times and knew she couldn't. Ayn gave up and accepted his execution. Lane mentioned that she had no intention of killing him, so she threw him off the building, then asked Edelgard and Jorge to track down Yogiri. Back with the protagonist, the robot mentioned that it wanted to negotiate with Yogiri and asked what he needed from the things it could offer. The protagonist mentioned if there was any way to return to the real world. The robot mentioned that it only knew the way to return to its own world, clarifying that if it could go to the real world, it couldn't take someone as dangerous. That night, Lane would learn of Santaru's death, so she sent the immortal army to search for Yogi. Right after Danara and Yogiri fled, both found themselves in the distance with the city of Hanabusa, which looked like a Japanese city. Danara noticed that our protagonist was very tired and asked him if he didn't want to perfect his skills. Yogiri responds that it doesn't make sense since he kills enemies one after another. Besides that, demons and thieves were coming after them. This scared Danara as he had been walking as if nothing had happened. Yogiri comments that he is aware of that. Danara reminds him that if he gets tired after using his power, then maybe his power can only be used a limited number of times or something like that. Yogiri explains that tiredness allows him to use his power as much as he wants. Danara asked him if he really has no limit. Both went to the city and explored the surroundings. Danara's specter comments that instead of building castle walls, they erected a barrier that protected them from threats. On the way, they encountered a giant hotel. Yogiri tells him that Celestina told him about that hotel, and that will be their base for a while. This excited Danner, who did not hesitate to enter, amazed at how luxurious the hotel is. The protagonist was also surprised by the modern and luxurious building. There they would meet with others of their companions, who recognized Danara. The boy comments that he is happy that they are safe. This boy's name is Takabana. Danara asked him why he was in the hotel, since he knew that the candidates for sages should still be in the primitive forest. Takabana explains that he moves separately from the whole group and it is not necessary for him to work with those who level up inefficiently. A blonde girl asked Takabana who Danara is, as she felt jealous of her for the way they treated each other. This blonde's name is Erika and Takabana tried to calm her, saying, Saying they are classmates. A group of girls praised Takabana for treating a group of rude people well. Danara asked the protagonist who those girls were or if he had seen them. Yogiri wondered the same thing. Takabana decided to introduce the group, saying they are his bodyguards and were specially chosen among all his servants. Each one introduced themselves Erika, Stephanie, Chelsea, Euphemia and Riza, the captain of the bodyguards. All of them manifested an aggressive aura and warned our protagonists to be careful how they treat Takabana. 
Also, they wouldn't speak to them or pay attention to them unless Takabana ordered them to. This offended Danara, who asked them to stop being hostile to them. Takabana apologized, explaining that he is not good at being tough with girls. He ordered his bodyguards to stay silent. Yagiri reminded Danara that Takabana was one of the students who stayed with them on the bus, so the power he just acquired is completely unknown. Danara tells him that the fact that he had bodyguards is normal, as he was always the popular guy among girls for a while, and that made him too arrogant. Yagiri blamed himself for not paying attention to high school, as he now saw it as a much more interesting place than he imagined. Takabana comments that finding them in the hotel is a kind of destiny, and asked Danara if she wanted to become his lover. This made the girls furious and Danara was stunned. Takabana apologized, saying that maybe he rushed too much in asking her to be his lover and asked if she is worried about Yagiri. He clarifies that he usually doesn't accept men, but since he was his classmate, he is willing to take him in as his servant. Danara uncomfortably mentions that none of Takabana's comments are funny. The protagonist tells him that he has no need to kill him when he lacks common sense. Danara asks Takabana what gives him so much confidence. He replies that he is a dominator, the strongest class. We are explained that the dominator class has the ability to control lower ranked opponents as slaves, and that allowed them to control everything. That's why Takabana is so confident. Danara comments that she has never seen Takabana so arrogant before and asked him if he hasn't trained enough yet, since the rest of the candidates continue training in the forest without apparent rest. Takabana decided to tell them a story. He mentioned that it all happened at a victory party in the village he arrived at after completing his first mission. He encountered Utori, and they sat down at a bar. Takabana decided to reveal that he is a consultant and his role is to provide advice. They tell us that consultants have the ability to analyze skills and provide advice for problem solving. Takabana asked Utori why he gives advice, and he replied that as a dominator, everyone avoids him. Takabana didn't understand what he meant, and Utori explained that he doesn't have time to fight among his peers now. If no sage emerges from their classmates, then they will all become livestock. What they should do first is buy a large number of level 1 servants, starting from the weakest. If the servants win battles, the defeated enemies can become servants. Takabana doubted this and commented that his ability didn't say such things. Utori responded that the consultant's ability also includes knowing hidden specifications of abilities. Takabana asked why he was telling him all this. Utori explained that he needs various methods to produce a sage. Anyone who uses the same methods is completely suicidal. Giving advice to those who seem promising increases the chances of success, and that's his survival strategy. After this explanation, Takabana set out to find subordinates. Yagiri commented that if that were the case, then for each subordinate he has, his level would increase. Takabana affirmed this, revealing that his level is increasing rapidly. After this, he asked Danara again if she wanted to be his lover. The other girls became jealous of this. Danara nervously clarified that she did not want to be his lover. Takabana explained that it doesn't have to happen now, she can just think about it. After this, he left. Danara was annoyed by Takabana's persistence, and Yogiri advised her companion to leave Takabana alone. However, if she joined forces with him, she might be safer. Meanwhile, in the forest, a shadow manifested and would fight with Lane. She explained that the shadow was called the aggressor, the darkness. That monster stood no chance against her. Back with the protagonist, he was sleeping in his room. Danara looked out of the room's window and wondered how long she could stay at the hotel. The specter told her that it would probably be until the protagonist woke up. Danara was curious and asked the specter if she could infiltrate to find out what was happening. She said she wouldn't, as she didn't know what would happen if she entered that room without permission. Danara decided to go outside for some fresh air, saying that training all the time was too exhausting. It was then that she saw darkness emerging from the city. Several armored trucks began destroying everything in their path. These were followers of Leon, one of them named Masayuki, who was in charge of leading the immortal body of the undead unit. The specter warned that she should be careful, as that immortal group was dangerous. While this was happening, Danara lay down on her bed, and the specter warned her that someone was secretly spying on them with hostile intentions. But despite sensing their presence, she couldn't see them. Danara decided to call the protagonist's room to warn him to be alert. Yagiri woke up from her dream, which was a childhood memory, answered, and Danara told her everything. The protagonist came out of his room sleepily and used a special vision that allowed him to observe the invisible person. He noticed that a dangerous scent was permeating Danara's room and didn't hesitate to kill her. Then he entered Danara's room, saying that Erika had hostile intentions toward her and deduced that there must be something in the room. 
Danra wondered why they wanted to hurt her. The protagonist decided to call reception and reported that a woman had collapsed in the fifth floor hallway. Danra was frightened and asked what he was trying to do. The protagonist explained that it would be too unnatural for no one to notice that there was a corpse in the hallway. Takabana received an alert on his screen informing him that Erika had disappeared. Meanwhile, Takabana would be in a dungeon with his bodyguards and they would face monsters to level up. After defeating the monster and taming him, he asked one of his bodyguards if she knew what happened to Erika. One of them replied that she should be at the hotel. Takabana checked the last thing Erika saw, surprised to find nothing, and wondered if perhaps she was attacked from behind. One of the girls commented that that couldn't be possible, as Erika is an assassin. Takabana wondered what Erika might be doing, and they all concluded that she was probably trying to please him by bringing Danara as a hostage. Takabana deduced that Danara probably tried to escape, so he would send his bodyguards to hunt her down. We switch scenes to Lane, who was facing the darkness, seemingly unaffected by her blows. Back with the protagonist, he was fleeing the hotel with Danara, but they encountered Riza. The latter would use a magic staff to freeze them and then mention that she was ordered to take Danara away. Our protagonist managed to break free from the ice without difficulty, which surprised Riza. She became nervous and tried to attack, but Yogiri quickly used his ability on objects, breaking them and disarming the girl. He explained that he could destroy and kill anything just by thinking about it, so she should act carefully. Riza was paralyzed with fear, and the protagonist interrogated her. Riza had no choice but to admit. Yogiri asked if she could use magic even without her wand. She replied that she was a wand master and that limited her to using wand magic only. Yogiri remarked that, in that case, being a master, she must have more than one wand. Riza decided to pull a wand from her bosom and then mentioned that she wasn't the only one as the rest of the bodyguards also had orders to capture Danara. One of them tried to surprise Danara from behind, but she managed to immobilize her on the ground. The protagonist noticed that she was a doll. Yagiri noticed that Riza was planning to kill him, so he didn't hesitate to use his ability on her, killing her. All the dolls went to attack Danara, and Yagiri took care of them and went to reception where he encountered one of them on the stairs. Takabana felt Riza's death, but also Chelsea's betrayal, who lost the will to fight and is selling all the information to the protagonist. Takabana analyzed the recordings and asked if it's possible to kill anything just by thinking about it. One of them said that sounds very unbelievable. Takabana decided to plan a strategy to analyze the protagonist's ability. Back with him, as they descended the stairs, they encountered a swarm of insects and easily went through them. Danra panicked because of her fear of these insects. Takabana took advantage of this to make these insects try to kill the protagonist. Yogiri decided to track Takabana's desires to kill him and located him. Having his location, he didn't hesitate to kill him. The remaining bodyguards were surprised to see Takabana fall to the ground. Danra panicked because of the swarm of insects and their hostile intentions. She momentarily believed that the protagonist had failed to deal with them. Yogiri reassured her that she shouldn't worry, as he had taken care of Takabana. He explained that his power can work at any distance as long as the enemy can reach him. If this happens, then he can track their intentions and kill them. He clarified that he deduced this part of his ability because the world is too hostile to allow unilateral attacks. Danara noticed that the insects were no longer doing anything, and the protagonist wondered if they had all been released from Takabana's control now that he was dead. The protagonist fled the hotel with Danara. Meanwhile, the bodyguards mourned Takabana's death and went outside. One of them was surprised to find so much light in a dense desert. Soon she felt danger and saw the darkness heading towards the city. Lane encountered the bodyguards and hypnotized one of them to turn her into his vampire, believing that she could survive the power of the darkness. Back with Yogiri, he suggested returning to the royal capital after everything that happened. They both heard screams and encountered a horde of zombies in the city orchestrated by the immortal troops. Both Yagiri and Danara were confused and wondered what they could do in that situation. We see the darkness making its way to the city. Lane wanted to test Yagiri's abilities and see what he is capable of and what he is not. He wished to verify if someone like him can really kill her after hearing Euphemia's story. We change scenes to the city, where everyone was turning into zombies. Danara asked why the city was filled with the living dead. Yagiri analyzed the zombies, mentioning that their movements were slow, so they could escape the city if they managed to move stealthily. Danara asked if they shouldn't help the civilians. Yagiri explained that it was highly unlikely they could save the city in that situation. The spirit told Danara that it was best not to worry about any of the civilians, as the priority was to leave the city immediately. Next, we see a politician arguing with Masayuki. He asked why Masayuki came to the city. 
arguing that Lane had left him entirely in charge of managing the city. Masayuki asked the politician, named Ryuta, not to be angry. They have known each other since they passed the test to become Lane sages and are comrades who survived the same battles. Ryuta asked if he died to become an undead. He decided not to dwell on this and ordered Masayuki to gather his army of zombies and leave the city as soon as possible. Masayuki told him that he was doing all this under Lane's orders. Ryuta was surprised to hear this and decided to take the matter seriously. Masayuki approached to tell him that all he had to do was hand over the key to the city. Annoyed, Ryota had no choice but to check the drawers of his office desk and handed over the key. Masayuki took the key and ordered all the zombies to stop. Gagiri and Danara were sneaking through the bushes and were confused to see the zombies stop moving. Masayuki asked the people of Hanabusa if they could hear him. He introduced himself as a follower of Lane and commander of the Immortal Corps. He told all the civilians that he was looking for a man named Yogiri and a woman named Danara. A photo of our protagonists appeared on screens throughout the city. Masayuki ordered them to bring both to the central square within an hour, alive or dead. He didn't care. However, if none could deliver them within an hour, the zombies would start moving. He threatened them saying that there was no point in escaping, as there were barriers around the city which were closed. All the civilians went into a collective crisis and began searching every corner of the city for the protagonists. Yagiri and Danara hid in an alley, the latter mentioned that due to the situation, humans are probably more dangerous than the zombies. Yagiri tells her that they have no choice but to run and not let them find them. Danara asked why they are being pursued. Yogiri deduced that it's probably because they killed a sage. The conversation would be interrupted by the sudden appearance of a group of men in that alley, who alerted the rest that they had found the protagonists. The group of men drew their weapons and tried to kill the protagonist, but he used his ability to ask them not to approach. Yogiri deduced that if the civilians don't even know about his power, it means that Masayuki is underestimating him, assuming that everyone knows he killed a sage. He wondered if it was possible to negotiate with Masayuki if they were to surrender directly in the square. Already in place, Danara and Yagiri appeared, touching each other with a more fantastic view than the rest of the world. Both encountered a group of undead waiting. Yagiri saw a red-haired man and asked if he was Masayuki. The latter refused to reveal his identity and asked about theirs. Yagiri had no problem disclosing his identity, just like Danara. Masayuki commented that they were boring people and asked if they were trying to sacrifice themselves for the people of the city. Yogiri denied it. Masayuki asked for the reason for wanting to appear, as if he killed him, the game would be over. The protagonist explained that he wanted to get on the train and go to the royal capital, so he needed him to remove the city barrier to use the station. Masayuki was annoyed to hear this and reminded him that he was not in a position to ask for favors. Yogiri offered Masayuki the opportunity to live if he let him go. Masayuki believed he was underestimating him and did not hesitate to send his immortal army against him. The protagonist used his ability on the army, ending each one of them, catching Masayuki by surprise. Ryuda, seeing the situation quickly, clarified that he had nothing to do with the matter. Masayuki wondered how it was possible for the undead to die. Yagiri commented that he also did not see it as possible. However, if something that is theoretically dead keeps moving, technically it counts as still alive. Masayuki responded that that made no sense, as something dead cannot die again. The protagonist corrected him, saying that he decides what is dead and what is not. Masayuki decided to use a bat form, but Yogiri did not let him finish transforming and killed him. Ryuta, seeing that Masayuki had died, decided to confess that Lane ordered the execution of both. The spirit alerted the protagonist that a spiritual manipulation was approaching the area. Yagiri detected several murder intentions in all directions heading towards the square. They were the city's inhabitants. Ryuta decided to help them and tried to make the barrier disappear, but nothing worked, and he deduced that Lane was the one manipulating the barrier directly. Euphemia recommended to Lane to be careful, as Takabana used the same strategy and with the hostility emanating. He was able to kill him from a distance. Lane asked how threatening Yagiri is. Euphemia responds that with the type of ability he possesses, he can be above any sage, sword master, and even mystical beings. So they shouldn't get more involved with someone like him. Lane asked if her idea is to flee and clarifies that that will not be possible. Lane was somewhat interested in the protagonist because, after enslaving Euphemia, the latter still remains concerned even though she is immortal. Back with the protagonist, he and Danara were surrounded by all the civilians. She asked if he could attack the source of manipulation or something like that. Yagiri replied that the situation is different from Takabana's case since their emotions were linked through their servants. A civilian jumped towards the protagonist to kill him, 
but he fell dead. Several tried to attack the protagonist at the same time in a synchronized manner, but none succeeded. Yagiri deduced that everything seems like some kind of test. The protagonist realized that Ryuta was suffering from the situation, as he did not want to see his citizens die. Yogiri came up with an idea and asked Ryuta to stay close to him. Lane saw that the darkness was close to the city, so she released a clone of herself with the same abilities and qualities. Euphemia asked what she was trying to do. Lane explained that she has a restoration ability, so if her original body or the clone dies, they can revive instantly. The clone split into more clones and Yagiri detected the increase in hostility. The darkness entered the barrier and devoured everyone in its path. Euphemia insisted that Lane flee. But she refused, saying that the clones have never seen or interacted with the protagonist, so they have no intentions of killing. This means that the protagonist can't do anything to them. Seeing the darkness, Yogiri had a bad feeling, but still decided to do something about it. He used his ability on the darkness, and this entity exploded, devastating part of the city. Danara asked if the darkness attacked, but Yogiri replied that it didn't, it simply exploded after dying. He wondered if they planned to use the darkness to ravage the entire area aimlessly. Thanks to this, he was able to deduce that someone already knows his abilities, including the conditions. Danara was able to see a woman in red descending from the sky like rain. Ryuta comments that this woman is Lane. Yogiri asked if this is Lane's attack, and Danara asked our protagonist why Lane doesn't die. Yogiri explains that, since she doesn't have any specific goal, the passive automatic counterattack doesn't work. In addition to that, Lane's approaching clones are so fast that his eye can't find them, so he can't use his ability normally against her. Danara asked why the clones can move so fast. Ryuta explains that it's Lane's body division, which allows her to produce copies of herself by separating her body and regenerating. Upon hearing this, Yogiri had an idea. Ryuta decided to help our protagonist by showing him the complete map of the city, which showed everything that was happening live. This means they could see the location of each clone and what they were doing. Upon analyzing, the three realized that there was a pattern of attack, which is that Lane doesn't attack the same place twice and consecutive attacks don't occur near each other. The spirit adds that Lane tried to make everything as random as possible, but unwittingly left a pattern of attack. Danra concludes that with this attack pattern, they can anticipate the next move. Yagiri continued analyzing and proposed moving to a warehouse. Ryuta tells him that he has the ability to teleport anyone while in his city. The three went to the warehouse, which was completely destroyed. Danara would use her enhanced vision to see Lane's copies, quickly with the help of the spirit. She created a barrier to stop the clone, and Yagiri took care of killing it. The spirit asked the protagonist if defeating each clone one by one is like trying to take a drop in the ocean. Yogiri tells the spirit not to worry about that since by using his ability, he could damage the clone. Lane sensed the death of one of her clones and wondered how that was possible. Gradually, the copies were destroyed, freeing the city from the attack. Euphemia asked Lane to retreat before she regrets it, but Lane insisted on killing Yogiri. She explains that the way she was able to defeat all the clones at once is because they had the same genetic configuration, so it's enough to change the configuration for each clone, one by one. However, at that moment, Yogiri's ability would take effect on the original body. Lane was startled to feel this, as her original body was in another dimension and she sensed its death. She wondered under what logic this could happen. Lane fell, and her body disintegrated after dying. We changed scenes to a dark mansion, a coffin opened, and a girl received a message from Lane. In the message, it is explained that Lane made a copy of herself which was genetically altered to be a completely different person. But in the end, they are the same person. Later, Ryuta thanked the protagonist for stopping the threat. During the night, we see a girl named Ryako Ninomiya defeating a chimera. The rest of her teammates praised her for her ability, and they all went camping. Ryako encountered Carol S. Lane. The latter had infiltrated to deliver Ryako her phone, which she had lost. Out of curiosity, she checked her phone and received a notification from a program called Alpha Omega which opened its first door. We see Danra driving near a cliff and almost falling off. She complained to Yagiri because he should be the one driving, but instead, he's just sleeping. The spirit mentioned to Danra that the protagonist is deeply asleep and not listening to her. Suddenly, she was forced to break abruptly as she saw a landslide blocking the path over the cliff. We switch scenes to Asaka Takatu, who was reviewing an interview. She asked the interviewer if it's true that she must be willing to die at work and not complain about it. The person, named Yukio Shireishi, affirmed it. Annoyed, Asaka tried to leave, but Yukio stopped her, saying she can't just go home since she was hired. 
he decided to show her around the facilities. The woman asked if the whole building is some kind of secret base for an evil organization. Yukio laughed and explained that it's not the case, it's just a respectable facility conducting experiments for society. They entered an elevator and waited to reach another floor. Asaka asked what her job was. Yukio revealed that her only function within the facilities is to care for and protect the monster. She was surprised, and the man clarified that they conduct cursed experiments in the building. Yukio showed Asaka a completely dark and red hallway. Asaka asked what it was, and the scientist told her its sacred text, which serves as comfort and works for some people. Nervous, Asaka wanted to know where they were going. The man said he was taking her to her workplace. They passed through another elevator, and he asked if she knew the term Alpha Omega. She didn't know what he meant. Yukio explained that Alpha and Omega are the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet, both words meaning everything or eternity. He revealed that this was the name he gave to the test subject she's supposed to care for. Asaka asked if Alpha Omega is a human, but he said no, as he has never seen it, so he doesn't know what to say. According to his studies, it's an entity that can kill anything it wants. Asaka said she can't handle such a monster, but Yukio reminded her that she has a master's license. The upset woman explained that having that license doesn't mean she can control such threats. Yukio warned that if the monster doesn't have a caretaker, there's a possibility humanity could disappear, but it could be avoided if given proper education. They arrived at a dark room, and Yukio told her she doesn't have permission to go to the end of the hallway. He left Asaka a sheet with instructions on what to do and left. The woman opened the high security door and found herself in a farm. She read the instructions, finding a map of the place, it was a simulation. She went to the house and found a boy. She couldn't believe Alpha Omega was a child and decided to take him outside to play. The boy quickly used his ability, killing a monster that had hidden in Asaka's shadow. She asked what that figure was, and the boy explained it's a demon. He said they usually come to try to kill him. Then he told Asaka he wants to play but prefers to do it tomorrow since it will be dark soon. Asaka apologized for this and helped the boy up, deciding to ask him for his real name. He said his name is Akakashi, although it's just a nickname since he doesn't have a name. They went back to the house and had instant ramen for dinner. Asaka decided to think of a name for the boy and called him Yagiri Takatu. Our protagonist woke up from his sleep by Danara, and she explained to him that they are trapped by a landslide. Then she asked why he slept for so long. Yagiri tells her that he got tired after using his ability for a long time. The protagonist asked why they had to go to the royal capital. Danara scolded him for not asking that question before the trip. Yagiri reminds her that the goal is to return to the previous world. He suspects that to achieve this, he must meet with Sion. However, he believes there might be a way to find Sion without having to go to the capital. Danara mentioned that all their companions are heading towards the capital for some reason. The spirit recommended they keep traveling to the capital but through a different route. Danara decided to reverse the car. A dragon appeared to attack them, and our protagonist used his power over the monster, defeating it. Danara warned Yogiri that a herd of dragons is approaching. Danara got scared when she saw that these dragons planned to attack them with their fire breath. Yogiri eliminated the entire herd at once, and the spirit mockingly remarked that the confrontations seem like a bug spray commercial. Yogiri suspects that they might have entered a dragon territory unknowingly. Suddenly, a golden dragon appeared in front of them. Danara asked the protagonist to defeat the monster, but Yogiri reveals that he doesn't sense hostility from the golden dragon and wondered if it's just observing. The golden dragon told them that they passed the test and quickly left. Yogiri noticed that the dragon was fleeing out of fear and asked it to stop, otherwise, it would end up like the rest of the herd. The dragon returned and decided to reveal its true form. It was a girl, who blamed herself for not leaving quietly. Danara asked why the dragon turned into a girl and the spirit explained that this often happens in Ice Sky worlds. Yogiri asked why she attacked them, and the girl explained that she wanted to test if they were qualified to see the Sword Master. Our protagonist was surprised to hear this and asked who the Sword Master is since it's the first time he heard that title. The girl asked them if they didn't take the route to see the Sword Master. Yogiri denied this and told her that they only wanted to go to the royal capital. The girl commented that in that case, the Sword Master will decide whether they can go to the capital or not with their gift. Our protagonist mentioned that he's not interested in meeting the Master since he's in a hurry to get to the capital. The girl insisted they go see the Master since she has orders from him to bring some promising candidates. She clarified that her Master is someone who rivals a sage. Yagiri, upon hearing this, asked Danara if they should go since, if so, he might have information on how to return to the real world. Danara warned him that they can't afford to take a detour if they're already lost on the map. 
The girl took advantage of this to propose that she will guide them to the capital with the condition of seeing the master. The girl introduced herself as Attila. The group got into the car and drove through the depths of the forest, finding there a bunch of people gathered. One of them asked Attila who the couple was. Attila decided to ignore him and explain to our protagonists that they are all gathered to become the next sword master. However, today they are supposed to choose the next knight of the divine king. Yagiri asked if he's trying to get them into some kind of trouble. A hooded figure approached the protagonist to tell them that they are disqualified. The sword master appeared to mention that the trials have not yet begun, so he cannot disqualify anyone. That sword master, named Yuri, asked everyone to engage in duels, and the last one standing would be his student. He warned that it's also valid if only half of the group remains standing, but if no one manages to fulfill either of the two conditions, then everyone would be disqualified. Yagiri refused to fight, but Yurabe told him that he cannot leave until the test is over. At that moment, the free-for-all battle began, and everyone started killing each other. A group of knights tried to attack Yagiri, and he attempted to use his ability, but a blonde boy stood in to defend them. The blonde defeated the knights, saying that nobody in the group understands the intentions of the sword master, as the idea of the trial is to see if someone is capable of making the right decisions. Danra was surprised that there was finally someone with common sense. Yagiri detected a group trying to intervene in the trial, knowing they were powerful people, and didn't hesitate to use his ability on them. The blonde was the only one who could perceive the protagonist's power and noticed that the attackers had fallen. He wasn't sure if it was Yagiri who did it, so he credited the sword master. The blonde told our protagonists not to worry, as he overheard them passing by chance in the area and got dragged into the conflict, so he's willing to accompany and protect them until it's all over. Danara noticed someone missing half their body pleading for help, so she saved his life by giving him a rainbow gem, which helped the boy recover his body. Only four remained alive in the trial and they decided to follow the sword master through the forest. The blonde introduced himself as Rick, and the saved boy introduced himself as Lionel. The latter explained that he only went to the trial because a friend invited him. Out of curiosity, Yagiri asked Rick who the Divine King is. Here, they explained that the Divine King controls the gods that have been sealed, also known as demons. A thousand years ago, the Dark God was sealed by the Divine King's own hands. The protagonist asked if the Dark God is still a threat even though it has been sealed. Rick affirmed it, mentioning that the Dark God's power permeates throughout the country. The group noticed that the Sword Master had disappeared, and Attila reassured them, saying it's just a protective barrier. They decided to pass through the barrier and were transported to another region, encountering a gigantic tower. The spirit warned Danara to leave the site as soon as possible, as there is immense darkness within. Lionel was affected by this darkness, but thanks to his ability granted by a goddess of luck, he managed to survive. Everyone realized that Attila was no longer with them, and Rick commented that the barrier probably prevented her passage, deducing that the people inside are just those trying to pass the trials. They decided to enter the tower and were taken to an elevator, which transported them to the top of the tower, where they encountered a dark portal. The master explained that this portal is known as the end of the world. Danara, with her enhanced vision, was able to see that at the center of the dimension, there's a man in black and a woman in white. She tells Yogiri that apparently, they were frozen while the man in black was being pierced by a sword. Rick comments that those two figures are the former sword master and the dark god. The current master explains that at any moment, the world could end, as a sword master is nothing but a watcher. A mage named Frederica proposed defeating both to resolve the conflict and save the world. She cast a powerful fireball towards the portal, however, the attack halted. The master mentions that within the portal, time flows slowly within the barrier. It may take several hundred years for that fireball to reach the Dark God. Thus, the Elder initiated the selection trial for knights. An assistant explains that the objective is to go from the top to the first floor of the tower within a 24-hour period. A girl named Teresa asked if it's valid to jump from the tower and land on the ground. The assistant says it's valid, but they must accumulate a minimum of 100 points within the tower to pass the test. Danara asked Yogiri if he's capable of defeating the Dark God. The protagonist told Danara that the Dark God has already been defeated. She asked how it's possible, and the protagonist explains that, unintentionally, he used his ability on the God, triggered by the immense dark presence it released, activating automatic instant death upon detecting hostility. We see Danara and Yogiri nervous after accidentally killing the Dark God. The protagonist suggested descending the tower quickly before anyone noticed. 
Lionel decided to follow them, but Frederica stopped him, asking for a magic stone as she needed to recharge her energy. Lionel explained that the magic stones he had only worked for him. Frederica left annoyed, labeling Lionel as a loser. Rick decided to team up with Lionel to accompany him. The protagonist and the others started descending the tower, encountering a lot of corpses along the way. Rick mentioned that they should thank the group of adventurers who went ahead, as they had dealt with most of the monsters and traps in the halls. However, Rick warned the group to be careful as he suspected there might be more traps that hadn't been activated. Lionel accidentally triggered a trap and was impaled by a spear in the chest. He managed to revive thanks to one of his magic stones, apologizing to the group and explaining that he had a kind of curse that worsened his luck, which is why he always died. Danara asked Lionel why he didn't carry the magic stones in his hand. He decided to follow her advice and entered a room ahead of the group. Rick became alarmed when he heard a scream, and everyone entered. There they found Teresa, who had been killing other participants. Rick asked her why she competed in that way, and Teresa explained that she accidentally kills people. Having lost her title long ago, and wanting to use the event to regain it, Rick decided to fight Teresa, but Danara stopped him, warning that the whole room was full of thin wires. Teresa praised Danara for her insight and attacked Rick, throwing her wires. The blonde used his shield to protect himself from all the damage. Rick began to have trouble defending himself from Teresa's attacks, and the protagonist intervened, using instant death on Teresa. The group found Lionel and helped him survive, continuing to advance until they reached the 98th floor, which was considered a safe zone for event participants, and it was strictly forbidden to start fights on the 98th floor. Yagiri decided to rest for a bit and discovered that there were rest rooms on the 98th floor, so he shared a room with Danara, while Lionel slept in another room, and Rick continued to advance in the tower. Meanwhile, we see the Swordmaster analyzing the entire trial from a supercomputer, one of his assistants mentioning several points of concern. The Swordmaster didn't understand what she meant, and his assistant told him that the number of deaths didn't match the number of souls in the tower. The Swordmaster, named Yurabe, commented that such a difference shouldn't be something to worry about, reminding them that the second barrier could still easily handle the necessary amount. The assistant mentioned that the barrier would still hold, however, they needed to replenish the half-demons used for the first barrier. The next day, we see a girl running through the fields and being attacked out of nowhere by explosions. These attacks came from a blonde boy who refused to be recruited by the girl. The latter mentioned that if he refused, she would kill him, as she was ordered to force participants to join her group. Before having to kill him, one of her eyes would glow red, which served her to analyze the powers of adventurers. While analyzing him, she asked if his name was Rikudo Seidu. Rikudo commented that fighting against a user of magic eyes was annoying for him, however, he clarified that he could also see names, calling her Ai Heianos. Rikudo would use magic to summon several tentacles to surround Ai. She, in turn, also used her magic, making the tentacles disappear as if nothing happened. Rikudo wondered how this was possible and continued to attack her. He would be surprised to find that Heianos was capable of copying his techniques after analyzing him and using them against him. Rikudo had no choice but to draw a magic sword to attack her. Ai brandished a dagger and dodged the blonde's initial attacks. When she saw an opportunity, she leaped to land behind Rikudo and placed the dagger at his neck as a threat. Rikudo attempted to resist, and Hyanos decided to decapitate him with the dagger. Soon, she received a message from her boss, who asked her to kill Yogiri and Danara. He recommended that she go to the city of Hanabusa to find them. Ai complained about this, as she didn't have a moment of rest to recover from her fights, but she left to search for them. A boy named Damon Hanakawa appeared to kneel before Ai and asked her to help him survive. He told her that he was taken care of by Rikudo, but now that he's dead, he has no one to protect him. Meanwhile, the spirit tried to awaken Danara by shouting at her. Danara woke up suddenly, thinking that the enemy had entered to attack them, but she was surprised to see Yogiri lying on top of her fast asleep. The spirit was glad that Danara had finally woken up and asked for her help, explaining that she got stuck in the wall. Danara asked how she ended up stuck, and the spirit explained that, seeing the protagonist half asleep hugging her, she thought something was going to happen and found it rude to interrupt them. For that reason, she tried to pass through the wall to avoid seeing them, but she got stuck. However, she mentioned feeling a strange power that is compelling the spirits and souls of the undead to gather in the tower for some reason. Danara asked if she had been stuck all night, which the spirit confirmed. Yagiri woke up because of the conversation, and the spirit asked him for help, telling him about a suction mechanism against spirits in the tower. Our protagonist knew that the spirit was important for Danara to be better protected, so he went to help her. 
He approached the wall and concentrated his energy, seeking a target. He found a flaw in the mechanism and activated it with his own hands, releasing the spirit. She thanked him for helping her and wondered why they were trying to gather the souls of the deceased in the tower. Yagiri deduced that there must be another reason for this trial and asked Danara to be very careful from now on. But above all, to be prepared to fight if necessary. Danara asked why. And our protagonist, knowing what was going to happen, warned Danara that he was going to kill anyone who was an enemy or tried to be one from now on. Danara asked if it hasn't been like that throughout the journey, and the protagonist explained that he has always tried to avoid killing, but with his power, he can perceive the intentions of the participants who are prepared and willing to do whatever it takes to win and leave the tower. Danara reassured the protagonist, saying he shouldn't worry, as she had gotten used to his ability, and the deaths of the enemy no longer affected her as before. Moreover, she wouldn't be rude enough to complain when she's saved. These words surprised Yagiri, who blushed, as it was the first time someone wasn't afraid of his ability. He told Danara that she should prepare breakfast because he was hungry. She asked if she could call room service, which the protagonist affirmed. We switch scenes to Ai, who was walking along a cliff with Damon. Along the way, they encountered Attila in her dragon form. Damon advised Ai not to fight since her ability couldn't match up against dragons. However, she would prove otherwise by causing Attila to lose control of her flight. She explained that her ability, called Just World, allowed her to change a phenomenon to match her beliefs. This helped her alter all kinds of phenomena and situations. However, the greatest weakness of the Just World was that she couldn't use it against opponents with a luck statistic higher than hers. Damon let his guard down after the explanation, and Attila bit his arm, tearing it off. Damon quickly used healing magic to recover his arm. Ai thought she had defeated Attila, so she wielded her dagger to try to kill her. Out of nowhere, a strange cut appeared and decapitated Attila. It was Hedgehog, who was trying to gather information from the environment. Ai decided to hide behind Damon as she knew Hedgehog was dangerous. Thanks to Hedgehog, Ai discovered the existence of the tower where Yogiri and Danara were, so she went to look for them, crossing the barrier. Back with our protagonist, he was advancing calmly through the floors with Danara, only finding remnants of fights. The two were already halfway through the tower when they encountered a golden knight who called Yagiri a cheater. Danara asked who he was, and he introduced himself as the tower's creator, who had the ability to emerge from anywhere. He commented that he disagreed with Yagiri and Danara casually descending the towers, bypassing all the puzzles and traps. The protagonist explained that all he wanted was to leave. The tower's creator clarified that they couldn't do that because the tower existed to maintain the barriers that hide the Dark God. If they let someone out, it would become a big problem because the barrier would break, revealing the Dark God's location to the world. Yagiri mentioned that if they let him and Danara out, they wouldn't ruin the barrier. The creator didn't believe the protagonist and asked what would happen if he was manipulated by a descendant of the Dark God. Yogiri decided not to continue talking because he considered the guy annoying. The creator introduced himself as Iglesia and threatened the protagonist. Without hesitation, he used his instant death on him, interrupting his threats. The tower supervisors and Yurabe received several warnings from the supercomputer that the first barrier around the tower became unstable. Not only that, but the door closing mechanism was malfunctioning. At the same time, Rick was defeating the participants he encountered, gathering a total of 100 points. While advancing, he encountered Lionel and Frederica. Back with Yogiri and Danara, they found a coliseum where two participants were fighting frantically with their swords. This was all being observed by a man named Masaki. One of the participants was actually a half-demon, which was discovered by Masaki. The half-demon introduced herself as Theodisia and wielded her sword, swearing that she would leave the tower before the other sword masters found her. Theodisia decided to use a technique that empowered her sword into a lightning bolt and defeated her opponent, causing a powerful explosion. However, she was surprised to find that her opponent dodged the lightning bolt. The opponent, who was a girl dressed as a rabbit, remarked that she could move much faster without weapons. She began to uncontrollably strike Theodisia, who had great difficulty defending herself. Yagiri and Danara decided to let the battle continue, believing it would end soon. However, upon seeing that it was dragging on, the protagonist decided to intervene, asking if he could proceed to the next floor. The battle was interrupted, and everyone stared at Yogiri. Masaki asked who they were, but the protagonist refused to reveal their identity or Danaras. Instead, he requested permission to advance to the next floor. Masaki denied it and asked why they didn't join them. 
he mentioned that his companions weren't earning points because they hadn't killed any other participants. Therefore, they closed off the passage in the Colosseum to earn points by defeating incoming participants. Yagiri commented that he saw no point in fighting since he and Danara had six points. Mesaki insisted they must fight. But the protagonist refused, explaining that he wasn't seeking points. Masaki revealed that he enjoyed the entire tower trial as if it were a video game and wouldn't allow anyone to leave the tower without earning the necessary points. Yagiri asked Theodija her opinion on the matter, and she remarked that she didn't care what they did, she just wanted to escape too. Masaki proposed a three-on-three -three battle. He suggested that if they win the confrontation against his students, they would let them pass even if they didn't have the required points to exit. Then, he introduced his students, Shiro the Rabbit, Gerald the Large, and Iman the Small. Danra began to complain to the protagonist about his negotiating skills. Theodisia warned the protagonists that if Gerald and Iman turned out to be stronger or better fighters than Shiro, they would have little chance of winning. Masaki mentioned that if they lose the 3 vs 3 battle, he will keep Theodisia and Danra as his slaves. Yagiri remained silent. When the battle began, he used his ability, defeating all three at once. Masaki was surprised, and the protagonist asked again if he could advance. Masaki refused, challenging Yagiri, but our protagonist killed him. Theodija stopped Yagiri to ask if he used instant death. He confirmed, and she apologized for underestimating him. Then, she asked for their help. Yagiri and Danara decided to listen to her. Theodija would tell Yagiri and Danara that she was looking for her missing younger sister clarifying that she is in the tower because she wanted to save lives as she had heard rumors that many people were being locked up in a place of certain death. Danara asked Theodija if she needed help finding her younger sister, which she affirmed. However, she warned that forming this kind of alliance could be considered an act of hostility towards the Supreme Sword. Yogiri reveals to Theodija that he destroyed the tower's security system, making him an enemy of the Supreme Sword from the beginning of the event. However, he clarifies to her that she shouldn't ally with someone who has the power of instant death, as he could accidentally end her life. Theodija mentions that she doesn't mind risking her life with such an alliance, affirming that she wants to find her younger sister at all costs. Yogiri decided to trust her and asked if she had any clues about her sister's whereabouts. Theodija talks about a basement in the tower and explains that her sister is probably there, as she senses the presence of her people in the basement. The conversation would be interrupted by the sudden appearance of a group of adventurers, Ricky, Lionel, and Frederica. They had formed a group since Yogiri and Danara separated from them. Danara greeted Rick and was relieved to see him alive. Both groups decided to join forces to advance in the tower without difficulties. They had been descending for hours until they reached a hall where other adventurers were gathered. The Sword Sage was in that hall and informed all the present adventurers, realizing that only 17 had managed to survive. Urabe, the Sword Sage, proclaimed the 17 survivors as Knights of the Divine Kai. Some nuns interrupted Urabe's words to inform him that the tower's security system had been damaged and the barrier hiding the building was starting to disappear. Soon, the rest of the barriers protecting the tower began to disappear as well, warning that if they did not act immediately, the minions of the Dark God would appear. Just then, an explosion caused an earthquake and collapsed part of the tower. The Dark Angel finally decided to show himself, now that there were no barriers, he could act freely, away from the heroine's power. Rick was frightened by the threatening presence of the Dark Angel. Urabe ordered the survivors to join forces to fight against that entity, otherwise humanity would be exterminated. Yogiri didn't pay attention to the situation and went unnoticed with Theodija and Danara, trying to find the basement. Danara asked Yogiri why he didn't defeat the angel, to which he replied that if he used his power, he might attract Urabe's attention, and he didn't want that. Theodija convinced Danara not to worry commenting that if Yogiri attracted too much attention, it could be a problem worldwide. Danara decided to heed the warnings and went to the basement with them. Rick decided to gather courage and face the Dark Angel, trusting that Lionel and Frederica would help him. The Dark Angel asked all the survivors about how to break the sacred barrier and return to his world, threatening them to ensure they answered. Burebe refused to answer, 
so the entity disintegrated one of the survivors with just a wave of his hand. The angel warned again that they should answer his question or he would kill them all, one by one. None of them wanted to obey, but little by little the adventurers began to disintegrate with each passing second. A ninja tried to attack the angel by surprise, but he disintegrated the ninja. Frederica used her magic to create a powerful explosion of light, but the angel was not affected by it and blocked the attack. He praised Frederica for her spell, saying that she used quite strong magic for just a normal human. Soon, a girl appeared next to the angel and both introduced themselves as Loot and Organ. Frederica attacked them again with her light spell. Loot felt that this time the attack would be dangerous, so he intervened, protecting Orgain from the attack. Loot mentioned to Frederica that she should be careful with her decisions, as even though she is a prodigious mage, she cannot compare herself to a deity. Before Frederica could realize it, her staff would now turn into an arsenal for Loot, causing Frederica to lose an arm, and Loot mocked her. Rick decided to attack her, and Loot commented that he could be a problem for both of them. Lionel stayed to protect Frederica while Rick confronted Loot. The latter evaded all attacks, mocking Rick and underestimating his power, intending to make him make a mistake out of anger. Meanwhile, Lionel received a message from his gacha system and used all the magical stones he had. He ended up summoning Vahanato, a goddess who brought Lionel to the fantasy world, she commented that she would take care of the situation and decided to attack Loot and Orgain. Rick stepped back and asked Lionel what he had done. He explained that he had successfully summoned a goddess. Orgain decided to kneel before Vahanato, commenting that it had been a long time since he had seen her. Loot embraced Vahanato and was glad to see her. Both Lionel and Rick didn't understand what was happening, but they had a bad feeling. Lionel asked Vahanato why she wasn't fighting, and she revealed that she had never been on their side. On the contrary, she was the one who caused all the misfortunes in his life. She commented that her plan was to manipulate him to join the minions of the Dark God and annihilate humanity. Lionel felt betrayed by this and didn't know how to react. We switch scenes to Yogiri. While he searched the basement, he noticed that the stairs had a mechanism that made them endless. Danara's ghost commented that this could only be possible with a barrier that altered empty space. As they descended, Theodisia mentioned that she felt the presence of her people getting closer. Danara asked Yogiri to destroy the barrier, but he refused, saying that he suspected Theodisia's people created the barrier, and if he destroyed it, he could kill all her people. Suddenly, the barrier broke without Yogiri doing anything, which made him suspicious of the situation. Danara could see that something strange had happened beside him, and out of fear, he hugged Yogiri, saying that an entity resembling a sword had just been released. Theodisia descended into the underground and entered a room. She was horrified to see inside, as she found capsules where her people were locked up. Yogiri asked Danara not to enter the room. He accompanied Theodisia and asked her if her people were inside the capsule, which she confirmed. Theodisia explained that her race was known to be among the most skilled in magical arts. She recounted that the capsule's purpose was to turn people into monsters to extract their magical power. She decided to wield her sword to end her people's suffering. Yogiri left her alone and left the room. Theodisia rejoined them and mentioned that she would personally end Yurabe's life. Back with Rick, he would be named by Ureb as a master of the sword to motivate him and to be able to fight against three at the same time. Lionel decided to buy time for Ureb and Rick by conversing with Vahanato. He asked her why she was on the side of the Dark God. She confessed that she was actually Albagarma's girlfriend, the Dark God. She revealed that she had been sending messages to all living beings from all worlds until she found someone who knew Albagarma's whereabouts as he had disappeared and never returned. When she could find his location, she decided to look for an easily manipulable living being among all worlds, making sure that this living being had the potential to defeat the Sword Sage. Loot mentioned that the barrier holding Albagarma was breaking. Vahanato would take advantage of it to steal power from Lionel and prevent him from being a problem. 
Just then, Yogiri, Danara, and Theodisia appeared. Albagarma would be released from his seal. However, everyone except Yogiri was surprised that Albagarma fell lifeless into a river. The woman with him, holding the seal, was known as the Divine Queen. She was astonished to have been released, but most of her surprise was seeing that Albagarma was dead. Theodisia took advantage of everyone's distraction to end Yurabe's life. At that moment, a sword-shaped monster appeared and defeated Vahanato. The latter would revive after the monster pierced her heart and ordered all the demon legions to annihilate humanity as revenge for killing Albagarma. The Divine Queen would protect Ricky and Lionel. Yogiri took advantage of this to use his instant death in the area, eliminating the Legion of Demons and Orgain. Theodisia comments that Vahanato and Loot are a threat. Yogiri mentions that he cannot use his power on the two of them because neither poses a danger to him and consequently, his ability cannot cause death. Suddenly, Aoi intervened to find Yogiri, seeing that the situation with Vahanato was getting out of control. She would assist Rick, revealing to him how to defeat her. Rick followed her advice and would be able to stab Vahanato to death. Yogiri was surprised by this as he did not expect Rick to actually be able to defeat Vahanato. Aoi used her power to analyze Yogiri. She wanted to know how dangerous he was for Sion to want him dead. She was unpleasantly surprised to find out that Yogiri had instant death and couldn't help but vomit from dizziness. This was because Yogiri had so much power that he represented the ultimate fate of all destinies. His power surpassed even that of the gods, which worried Aoi, wondering why he ended up in another world. Aoi decided to flee from there for fear that Yogiri would kill her, as she wanted to confront Sion and ask her more about him. When all this ended, Rick would interrogate Theodisia for having killed Yurab. She comments that she ended Yurab to avenge her people, as he had been experimenting on her race to steal their magical power. Rick mentions that this did not justify her decision as she could have compromised humanity. After all, Yurab was the only one who could stand up to the Dark God. Theodisia would ask him if he intends to kill her for that, which Rick affirms. Yogiri intervened in this, warning Rick that he would defend Theodisia if necessary. Rick mentions that he doesn't have powers to fight against a sword sage. The Divine Queen asked Rick not to bother Yogiri anymore, saying he had no chance against him, and revealed that it was Yogiri who defeated the Dark God and his Legion of Demons. The Queen would ask Yogiri why he was intervening in conflicts from another world. He explains that he has no intentions of interfering, but he has been acting to survive. She decided to forgive Yogiri and thanked him for defeating the Dark God. Rick asked Yogiri about his identity, as he didn't believe he was human now that he knew the truth. Yogiri mentions that he is just a normal student, hiding who he really is. Rick questioned him about what he would do from now on. Yogiri says he will visit the royal capital, and Rick mentions he will go to the same place so that Frederica can recover her arm. Rick wanted to accompany Yogiri on his journey, but the latter decided to separate from them for safety and left with Danara to the capital. He wanted to find Sion and return to his world at all costs. Meanwhile, we see Sion summoning a human from the same world as Yogiri. She had learned about everything that happened with the Dark God and was interested in him. The human who had been summoned was a scientist. Sion asked him if he knew Yogiri. Upon hearing that, he was scared. It was obvious he knew him, but his fear was not so much about Yogiri, but knowing that parallel worlds existed, and he feared that there might be someone as dangerous as Yogiri somewhere. Before the scientist could tell Sion about who Yogiri is and his origin, he would be interrupted by an alert on his phone. Just by reading the message, his head would explode. Sion was horrified by this and wondered what kind of entity Yogiri was to cause fear in another world. A girl named Ayaka Shinazaki would wake up on that bus where Yogiri and Danara came along with the rest of the students. A mysterious voice resembling a system would reveal to her that she is an android. The voice introduced itself as part of the AI unit that had just restored her life. Ayaka would realize she had a fatal injury to her body 
and only had 30 minutes to recover before her systems shut down. The AI asked Ayaka if she wanted to maintain her appearance as a human, or if she wanted to move on to the next phase. Facing the situation and her injury, Ayaka deduced that she had died and wondered what had happened. The AI decided to remove a limiter from Ayaka and asked her to collect a large amount of materials for her recovery. It recommended that she use the organic material from the dragon next to the bus, referring to the same one Yogiri had just defeated upon arriving in the world. Ayaka approached the dragon and took all of its organic material, beginning to regenerate her wounds. We switch scenes to the past and see Asaka Takatu preparing lunch. She wasn't very accustomed to cooking and ended up ruining part of the lunch, which made her very sad. Yogiri didn't help lift her spirits at all and was honest, saying that the lunch tasted bad. Asaka scolded him and asked him to eat anyway, advising him that if a girl prepares something for him to eat, he shouldn't complain or give a negative opinion because that would make him less attractive. Yogiri didn't understand what she meant and simply ignored her. Asaka would review the task list given to her by the laboratory to contain Yogiri. While reviewing this list, she realized she needed to provide some education to Yogiri. Asaka didn't know what things she could teach Yogiri, so she only taught him how to write. During that class, they both heard someone enter the house, which surprised Asaka. She asked if he lived with someone else, but Yogiri denied this, explaining that it was probably a messenger. Asaka went out to meet this messenger and encountered a girl who mentioned that she was just visiting the house to drop off some food. Asaka realized that the girl was actually a robot and questioned whether it was a good idea to raise Yogiri in an environment of artificial lives. She took the opportunity to ask the robot if it would bring more than just food, which the robot confirmed. Asaka asked her to bring a primary school textbook, a cookbook, and some kitchen items. The robot agreed to each of the requests and left the food. Asaka returned to Yogiri and decided to go out with him for a walk in the fields to observe the landscape. One month later, Asaka would submit a report to the laboratory about the progress she had made with Yogiri. This excited the scientists, as it was the first time someone had survived a whole month with Yogiri. Yukio Shireshi, one of the available scientists, congratulated Asaka for her achievement. She asked him to occasionally send more people to visit Yogiri, mostly teachers so he could be well-educated. But Yukio rejected this, explaining that bringing people with Yogiri isn't as easy as it seems as most people resign after the first night upon learning what Yogiri really is. Asaka wouldn't hesitate to take a vacation to stay away from Yogiri, as she still wasn't completely prepared to take care of a child and wanted to take a break from so much responsibility. During one of her naps, Asaka found herself inside a dark room. She wondered how she ended up there but couldn't remember anything, lamenting having spent the month's salary on excesses. A robot appeared to tell Asaka that she was trapped in a room and assured her they had no intention of harming her. This robot informed her that she was inside a room belonging to an organization that deals with interrupting calamities and seals them in other worlds to prevent the destruction of humans. Meanwhile, Yogiri was sad and somewhat frustrated because Asaka hadn't come back to visit him, so he decided to escape with the help of one of the robots that took care of him. The scientists were alarmed by this and called the head of the experiment Yukio. The latter decided to appear in the laboratory offices upon learning that Yogiri was escaping. He wanted to dialogue with him, but found out that all his colleagues had died. In one of the security cameras, he saw a robot helping Yogiri escape. Yukio asked what they did to Yogiri to make him become hostile, and a surviving scientist commented that they all tried to return him to his contingency room, but it ended badly. Yukio contemplated taking his own life to avoid risks however, Yogiri appeared out of nowhere to prevent this and inquired about Asaka. Wukio remained calm and told him that she was on vacation. Yogiri wanted to know when she would return, and Yukio affirmed that Asaka wouldn't return. Yogiri asked why, and Yukio explained that the agency took Asaka away to interrogate her. 
Nyogiri asked why Yukio wasn't helping Asaka to escape, and Yukio revealed that he had no power to do so since the agency has global reach and government support, so he couldn't do anything. Yogiri offered to go rescue Asaka and asked everyone to keep the massacre he just committed a secret. Both Yukio and some guards had no choice but to agree to keep everything secret. Later, at the agency, Yogiri would appear, ending everyone and causing a large-scale massacre, destroying buildings and everything in his path. Yogiri looked at one of the security cameras and spoke directly to the agency's high command, demanding that they release Asaka. The latter would hear all the commotion and wonder what was happening. A woman would take Asaka hostage to try to contain Yogiri, who was now serious about rescuing Asaka. Seeing how the woman threatened Asaka, Yogiri didn't hesitate to end her life. This impressed Asaka, who didn't understand what was going on or how things got out of control. She decided to remain calm for Yogiri's sake and would escape with him from the agency. Although Asaka was horrified to see all the carnage Yogiri left behind, she continued forward, trying not to judge him, as despite knowing he was a calamity, she couldn't help but see him as a child. The next day, Asaka and Yogiri returned to the contingency room. Asaka took the opportunity to speak with Yukio and asked what would happen from now on. Yukio commented that he couldn't do anything about it, as the situation was simply out of his control. This surprised Asaka a bit, who asked if he wouldn't face punishment for what happened. Yukio explained that they couldn't punish Yogiri because it was beyond what they could handle and he warned Asaka that from now on, she couldn't resign because she was the only one who could keep Yogiri under control. He promised her that from now on, they would take stricter security measures when she had to leave the laboratory so they could prevent another incident like the one at the agency. Asaka didn't feel like taking care of Yogiri and containing him forever, but she also didn't want to leave him soon. After careful consideration, she promised Yukio that she would educate Yogiri and teach him how to be human. Thus, there won't be any more incidents and he will be someone who can leave the laboratory without being a threat. Back to the present, Danara realized that Yogiri was sleeping peacefully. She couldn't help but find him attractive in that state and realized she was beginning to fall in love with him. Yogiri woke up and looked toward the entrance of the capital. Before they could think of a plan, they would be surrounded by several people. A boy approached them both to ask them to follow him. Both Danara and Yogiri were somewhat worried they might be arrested, but they were prepared to use violence if necessary. They both decided to follow the boy, who introduced himself as Torx, the chief security guard of the capital. He informed them that they were riding in a vehicle belonging to the Immortal Corps. Yogiri understood the situation and explained to Tork that they were not part of the Immortal Corps. He explained that the vehicle was granted by Ryuta, the mayor of Hanabusa. He then informed him that they were candidates for sages. Tork was somewhat suspicious of both of them and asked them to demonstrate their abilities. Both allowed themselves to be scanned by the guards. Tork mentioned that although they passed the test, it didn't mean he trusted them, as anyone could falsify the sage test. Danara was desperate in the situation, as she didn't want to go to prison, and asked what they needed to do to enter the capital. Yogiri decided to show everyone the necklace given to him by Rick, causing the guards to kneel. Tork explained that the necklace Yogiri wore was an amulet engraved with the shield of the royal family. He was impressed that someone like Yogiri and Danara had that necklace, but they were allowed to pass without trouble. A man appeared to prevent this, saying he wouldn't allow anarchy. This man's name was David, and he refused to let Danara and Yogiri pass until they proved themselves worthy of entering the capital, claiming he was part of the royal family as the youngest member. David challenged them to a fight to see if they truly came on behalf of Rick. Danara decided to confront David with a dagger and managed to trick him. David fell for Danara's deception and received a kick in the groin, something that even hurt Yogiri. All the guards celebrated Danara's victory. The spirit accompanying Yogiri and Danara commented that Danara was so fast that to the eyes of others she seemed to teleport. 
already in the capital, Yogiri would realize that several areas were protected by spells that prevented their passage. David followed Yogiri to keep an eye on him. Seeing that he encountered a spell, he told Yogiri that the capital's wall was built by a great mage in antiquity and could withstand any attack. After this conversation, David took Danara and Yogiri throughout the capital, where they discovered that there were more people than usual, as the capital was being used as a meeting zone for explorers and warriors. This was because they were going to embark on a journey to the underworld. Yogiri decided to separate from David and went to a secluded spot with Danara. He told her that they would soon meet their classmates, who were candidates for sages, and there might be conflicts. He asked Danara if she intended to forgive them despite what happened on the bus, or if she wanted to take them down. She didn't know how to respond, but she went to the capital ceremony with Yogiri. There, they met all their classmates along with the King of Manii. Some students underestimated the king, thinking he was weak, so he put them in their place, showing no mercy to any. Yogiri knew that the king was not someone easy to defeat, as he was able to ignore a time-stopping ability from another student. Once the king had everyone's attention and respect, he mentioned that there was only one thing they must do to become sages according to Sion's conditions. If you've reached this part of the video, comment the word power in the comments. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of this anime.